Welcome to the Igniting Impact podcast, brought to you by Public Knowledge. I'm Stacey Moss, the host of the podcast and the president of our management consulting firm. Our firm's vision is to be a catalyst for change, leaving each person, project, client, colleague, and community better than when we started. The Igniting Impact podcast is an opportunity to share with you what our clients do daily to impact our world. And we wanna highlight this essential work and the work that they do for their stakeholders that is changing lives despite the many daily challenges that they face. On today's episodes, we have three guests with us. They're here today to discuss the National Advisory Council on Children's Legal Representation. So let's start by getting to know you all a bit more. If you could each just tell us a bit about yourself, what you do for NACC right now and how you got involved. Hi, yeah. Uh, my name is Cristal Ramirez. I'm the Youth Engagement Manager at NACC. Uh, I have lived experience in California's child welfare system. Um, I got involved back in 2020. I applied for the first youth coordinator position to kind of uh, get this work started. Um, and I've been at NACC since then. Welcome. Thank you. So I, my name is Nicole Wong, and I am actually um, one of the members of the NACCLR. I have lived experience in the New York City foster care system, uh, and I sort of use both that experience and I, um, I had professional experience working in social work as well at a foster care agency called the New York Fowling in New York. Currently, uh, do corporate law, so my full time is corporate law, but um, part time I'm a member of uh, this amazing sort of group of individuals. We all have lived experience from across the nation. I'm the one from New York, one of them. Great, welcome. Good morning, my name is Allison Green. I'm the legal director at the National Association of Council for Children. We are a membership training and advocacy organization that really represents the attorneys who are advocating on behalf of children, parents, and agencies to provide high quality legal representation in foster care court cases and at NACC, I focus on our policy advocacy as well as supporting the work of the Advisory Council. Great. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Well, let's get to know you on just a more personal level. If you'll tell us kind of who you are outside of work and what values you live your life by, and maybe we can just go the opposite direction. So, Allison, if you want to start, that'd be great. Sure. A few things that come to mind, I think I, I've always carried a strong like value of service growing up and into my college years, you know, have found that to be a really guiding principle in my professional and personal life that has helped shape, you know, how I spend my time, how I've made career choices and, you know, where my, my resources and energy go. You know, as a lawyer, I also have a strong sense of, of justice and fairness um, that is, is a guiding value in everything I do. Nicole, do you want to share a bit about who you are outside of work? Yes, thanks, Stacy. I I feel terrible sounding like I'm copying Allison here. <laughs> I I also really value service, and I think it's really stems to the idea of you know just helping other people because um, uh, my faith is really important to me, and it's just sort of like ingrained in there that you 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 help others, and you know if you see someone who's sort of low and and you can give them a helping hand to help them get up like that's that's what you do and you know people actually often think i'm an extrovert and i, I say no no i am uh, i'm an introvert but if i see someone who's alone or something or or just needs a helping hand i'm definitely gonna go and um you know start interacting with them and i come across as an extrovert but it's really just because i like helping people and i love making sure that everyone feels loved and i don't know exactly how every single individual, you know, likes to receive love, but I know how I like to give it. And one of them is through helping, through giving back and through trying to just make sure if I have the tools to help in a situation that I, I use them. And I also like humor. <laughs> um, it's very, very important to me. <laughs> yeah. So that um, wanting to help others and serve others takes you out of your shell then. I love that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and and any dad joke. And <laughs> they are the best, actually, as le as le at least for my children. <laughs> uh, Kusal, do you want to share with us what you what values you live by outside of work? Yeah, I think my values come a lot from being an older sister. Um, I'm the second oldest of nine, and I think that's 
one of the biggest parts of my identity and kind of just how how I kind of like live my life, both personally and professionally. Uh, I think one of my biggest values is kindness. I live by the quote in a world where you can be anything, be kind. I uh, I try to choose kindness as much as I can. I'm not perfect. And sometimes I get frustrated and, and have to bite my tongue or should bite my tongue and I don't. But I try to lead with kindness and authenticity. I think it's really important to be who you are, show up as you are, uh, and all the human imperfections that we bring. And so uh, I value authenticity a lot as well. And just being able to to show up in whatever uh, version of yourself you are. And yeah, I think uh, similar to Nicole too, uh, humor, I try to I try to just like laugh and spread joy as much as I can, um, whether that's through dad jokes also. Uh, I feel like I'm a little dorky sometimes and like to, to say dad jokes or say things that are just kind of like silly that sometimes I also wish I bit my tongue, but if it made people laugh or if it just made me laugh, I feel like that's like, all right, okay, we're doing something. But yeah, I think that's a little bit about me and, and my values. Okay, you too. Now I, uh, we need a we need like the best dad joke or one that comes to mind this morning. Either of you have one? I have several. Like, uh, what are we what are we looking for here? <laughs> Give us which one you think would be most fun this morning. Okay, where where do you store dad jokes? Where? In a database. <laughs> That's for my favorite law professor. He 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 said that one, and it it cracked me up. I can very strongly say that none of my law professors told jokes. <laughs> so I'm very jealous. It was a long time ago, though. <laughs> I'm glad that you had some humor. <laughs> you guys tell us just a little bit more about um, the National Advisory Council on Children's Legal Representation. And I don't know, Crystal, if you want to start kind of just giving us an overview of what the purpose of the council is, and then. We can have um, Allison and Nicole jump in with anything else to add. Yeah, Allison could talk a little bit about like uh, prior to, to me uh, joining, but when I joined, the purpose was to bring a, pe- uh, a group of people with lived experience, um, lived experience experts who had both personal and professional uh, experience in the child welfare system. And it's set to uh, range between 18 and 30 years of of age. Um, we did that purposely to uh, have it be a little wider than than most spaces and also to get a, a variety of experience uh, in regard to that. Um, and it's to have them advise uh, what uh, the work that NACC is doing, what priorities we're selecting. And we moved closer and closer to having folks at the beginning. We could talk about that a little bit later, but that was the intention to really have the NACC law members be a part of NACC's work and then be be the guides to to what we're doing and being able to also offer their lived expertise to the broader child welfare legal community, whether that's through presentations, trainings, again, through the decisions that are made through NACC. When uh, we first had our our cohort, uh, we were working on refreshing the recommendations for children's attorneys. And so that was one of the first uh, big projects that the NACCLR worked on. It was a, a very intentional process of of having it of us working really closely with lived experience experts to to showcase what attorneys can and should be doing when working with uh, with their clients. So that's a very broad overview of what what the NACCLR was was put in place at NACC to do. Great, that's super helpful. And then tell me again when you started. How long ago was it? Did you say a couple of years? I started in June 2020, and I. The NACCLR, and which was actually the it was it started off as a, the National Youth Advisory Board uh, that was a placeholder because we wanted to be intentional about uh, what is now the NACCLR to be able to name themselves and be being able to do it in regard to the work that they were doing. So it was kind of a year long process of of even that. But to answer your question, sorry, the they came on in July, and then we're onboarded in August. So that's when uh, we had the first cohort of the National Youth Advisory Board, which is now the NACCLR. So about three years the group's been together. Does that sound about right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Nicole, what would you add? Anything that you would add about kind of the purpose and what it is? I think the most important part, um, you know, just speaking as a, as a current member, you know, we are all professionals, you know, so we have 
different careers or some of us are are in school working towards a career but what i found to be sort of the most impactful thing that each of us brings to the table is that we really come from across the country and i i think that's super important to emphasize because the child welfare system it's so distinct state by state um, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, even though, you know, the, the goal uniformly in the world, you know, is to, to make sure children are, are safe. But, um, you know, even in this country, the way that each state approaches that, you know, even if there are sort of this, this federal umbrella of how we should care for children, um, it's just really, really different. And, you don't know that as much until you bring a group of individuals who've been in the system from these different jurisdictions and have us come together and it and it can be on any topic but give us a topic and hear us talk about what our experience was like or you know what we know the experience to be like through um peers that we we still have in the system etc it's it's just mind blowing so I think it's just awesome that everyone's so diverse. And that's, I think, really the underlying import of what NACC did here is that you don't just have this national organization bringing together young people, but it's it's really specifically young people who've got life experience and they've got the foster care lived experience and they've got a heart to just help and give back and they have the tools to do that. But it's also that we we come from just this really distinct, each of us uh, background that when we all come together at the table, it really is a diverse mix. Um, and we really are very like solution oriented because we all recognized the ways that the system could be improved while we were in it. And when we saw this opportunity, each of us said, wow, amazing, got to be a part of it. And for me, it's just been really wonderful getting to know the other individuals, hearing their experience. And yes, just again, learning that the the true value is seeing how it's so different and how we want to take those differences and just really make solutions on a national level that will help make just everything better for young people who are going through the system. Yeah, Nicole, I... Um... I'm remembering back to a like networking event at an NACC conference a couple of years ago and the, the council was there and I was watching and talking to um, some of the members and just seeing the relationships and how strong they were and how close and I don't know, it was a really great experience for me to be able to see like that, those connections and relationships building from across the country with, with all of you was really lovely. Yeah, I, I think if, if I could add to that, actually, a, a really special thing for me through all of this sort of lived expert advocacy work, I've, o- I've only been doing it since graduating, and that was last summer. But it's really been such a meaningful year and a half for me because it's the first time where I get together with a complete group of strangers mm-hmm. and instantly connect, instantly feel like family. At the last conference, we all went to an amusement park. You know, like, it's really just like, in, and how often can you do that with a complete group of strangers? But I think it really is that the shared experience and the shared desire to improve outcomes for children that we have, it just instantly bonds us. We don't even really have to say much before we feel that connection. And I've I've never felt that way before with other groups. And I'm, I'm glad that you as an observer was were able to just see that instantly because it's, it's definitely genuine and true. Yeah, it was pretty remarkable. And I just remember thinking what a what a great group for people for for you all to be able to rely on to just getting through life. So. Exactly, yeah. Allison, anything that you would add or anything about the kind of history of the council and how it got created or why it got created? You know, well, very interestingly to me is that what NACC was founded in the 1970s and having a lived experience advisory body like this was actually in our bylaws. At that time, they didn't use the term lived experience or lived expertise, you know, but they they called for, I think it was youth advisory board or youth advisors. And that mandate in our organizational bylaws had kind of been dormant for decades. 
And so this was really a fulfillment of our mandate. And, you know, NACC really sought to launch this in 2020 to bring that to life and to make sure that all of our programs were being co-led and guided by a constituent voice. Um, so, and so that's what led us in 2020 to open a call for two things. Um, for the first cohort of the advisory council, terms are two years. So we are now in our third cohort. And to our first call for the, um, it was then the youth engagement coordinator and now the youth engagement manager position, which is Cristal's position, um, because we thought it was both important to have the advisory council, but also have the internal staffing to support that council and that lived expertise on staff. Um, so we've just really been in this evolution over the last three plus years to integrate NACCLR members into our different committees and departments. We have advisory council members um, participating in our training department, policy committee, and also some, you know, both internal and external work that didn't occur to us right at first. Our conference work, our finance committee, our development work alongside our ED, you know, our communications work with our communications manager. We've tried over time to get better about capitalizing on that but yes, the lived expertise, but also, as Nicole mentioned, the professional expertise that mm-hmm. each of the individuals is bringing. You know, lots of them have really interesting uh, professional backgrounds and are helping strengthen our programs across the board. That's great. So who who was involved in getting it started? And kind of, I know that it was there before um, in the bylaws, but why, why reinvigorate it or why rebring it up? At the time, um, our current executive director, Kim Dvorak, was really in the process of implementing a new strategic plan for the, for NACC. And part of that was making sure that we imbued two core values into all of our work. And those are race equity and constituent voice. And so it was really um, the vision of the staff to go back and, and bring that piece of the bylaws to life. So and so Kim sought out the support of funders to bring in you know bring this work into play, and and that's where it's been ever since. So I'm guessing um, how many how many of the youth are on the council, or I guess adults. How many adults are on the council? <laughs> I'll make a, a note really quick. Actually, I, we were also we don't call our advisory council members youth i usually will just say advisory council members yeah Uh, and that was i think that was part of the biggest uh intention too nicole spoke to it allison spoke to it but when we were starting we really wanted to make sure that we stayed away from the word use uh from getting feedback from our advisory council members as well because i wanted to ensure that it was an advisory council that people look to our lived experience experts as the professionals that they that, that they were as in the folks who have been on the council before and that they are uh for the current members yeah we we don't really use the word youth when we're when referring to any professional with lived expertise but again to answer your questions there have been uh 12 advisory council members each cohort um we started with 12 uh our inaugural group when uh we did the second uh cohort we had six continue into their third year. Um, and then after that, we have a uh, kind of a roll on roll off basis. So we have um, six folks for two years um, and then six new folks join during uh, after their first year. So that's kind of how it's uh, it's structured. And is it a volunteer position? Is it a paid position? How does I know, Allison, you mentioned some funding for it. So I'm, I'm curious how that's how those professionals are supported for their time. Yes, it's a paid position. It started off as a quarterly stipends for the monthly meetings that they're attending. Uh, they're required to attend two hours of monthly meetings each month. <laughs> and then uh, outside work, they were paid hourly. Since we first started, uh, the rate uh, has gone up fairly significantly, but folks get paid. Uh, now, instead, of, there's no stipends. They get paid hourly for all of the work that they do, uh, which is two hours monthly and for their monthly meetings and then uh, any outside work they do, like attending department meetings, uh, board of director committee meetings, any projects that they're on and stuff like that. And the rate is $50. That's great. Cause I know um, years and years ago when places started having lived experts, it was not that way. So I'm, 
I'm really great. I'm glad to hear that. I think the listeners, it's an important thing for the listeners to hear that it is a professional position and not not anything less. I know you guys talked a little bit about kind of the purpose. I'm, I'm curious what the overarching vision is. It, and it sounds like it might be just influencing the activities of NACC, but also the larger legal profession of attorneys representing kids in court. Is that a is there anything else I'm missing there about that kind of vision for the advisory council? If I can add, and Alison yeah. and Christophe, please correct me if I'm wrong. I I think a, a really um, important component of the vision is, you know, NACC's goal is to help with the, with, yes, like the legal representation and, and the outcomes and influencing policy that impact um, young people who are in the system or have in, been impacted by the system and families that have been impacted by the system, communities, and what better way to do that than to actually involve those who have that experience. It's like like for so long, the conversation has been going on since since the dawn of there being you know, young people in need of um, government-supported care. But, you know, it's only in recent times that folks are actually saying, why don't we hear from people who have been impacted so that we learn how to navigate these solutions better and, and what, what solutions actually would be helpful, like actually getting the feedback and hearing. Um, so I, I think like part of the vision is really just saying we're trying to help, let's actually listen to how we can help. Um, and NACC does a, a great job with that. The experience I've had so far, really, we have been um, able to communicate when situations are challenging or, or when a, a policy really might not be the best um, approach. And uh, yeah, our, our opinion is is valued. And I think that's the most important thing you can do when sort of working with those of us with experience is not to dismiss that experience. I love that. I, I fully agree, Nicole. I, you know, I think the vision is to to do better, right? I, I mean, if you look at the history of our field and you look at the outcomes that the American Foster Care System is producing and you listen to the feedback of people who have um, lived experience experts in the system, it, it is not meeting it, the mark. And so the vision here is to is to do better and to be more effective. We know that if judges and lawyers design a training for other judges and lawyers, that's great. But how do we know if it's actually what our clients need unless lived experience experts are involved in the evolution and design of that training? If I go or my colleagues go and advocate for a policy on the state or federal level um, and we say, hey, legislature, you know, you should do A rather than B or C rather than D, I mean, that that's one person's opinion. But how much more credibility and impact will we bring to that policy if we know that it's informed by what lived um, experts have said are the changes, you know, that need to happen in the system? So, you know, really a, a lot of the vision is efficacy and impact to to really see change that's long overdue. And is the council focused on quality legal representation for kids and youth in like the juvenile courts, or is it focused more on the, the whole child welfare system? NACC's mission is really focused on high quality legal representation and the courts. Uh, there's so many great organizations in this space doing important work. And so we really focus our resources and our staffing on the legal aspect of child welfare law. Um, this is a area of professional expertise that requires specific, you know, legal knowledge, social science knowledge. So that's really what we focus on. And that's where a lot of our projects have come from. So if we're looking at policies, we're looking at how do these policies impact the court system? How do they ensure due process and high quality legal representation for young people? Um, Christelle mentioned that one of our inaugural projects was to revamp NACC's recommendations for the legal representation of children and youth in neglect and abuse proceedings. Uh, this is a best practice document that outlines 10 standards that should guide all attorney work. Um, the prior version we had of this was about 20 plus years old. And 
it was outdated, you know, quite frankly. It was a document written for lawyers by lawyers. And it was really important for us to take a fresh look at that with the eyes and the expertise of, of lived experience experts to say, okay, no, this is how we need to re-anchor what legal representation looks like. And from there, a lot of the projects that have come since have also focused on the court system, access to justice, and legal representation. So, Crystal and Nicole, I'm actually curious if you um, were, let's say we have some listeners who are new attorneys or new attorneys to representing youth in in child welfare or juvenile court, what, what would you tell them is the most important thing to keep in mind or something that would help guide guide their work? Just sort of piggybacking off of um, the, the project Allison was just talking about when the first cohort of the advisory council got together and was identifying what would be valuable for young people um, for their legal representation. Um, and just hearing your question, the very first thing that jumped out to me, and it, it comes from one of those um, values, is just being, like having the truth, like having the information. Um, really, no, no matter how young one is, of course, you're going to scaffold that. But one of the scariest things um, I can remember was, you know, being in court or being in the agency. And uh, it's my older brother and I, and we're just, you know, sort of left there in the hallway while all the adults around us are making these decisions about our lives. And we don't really know what's going on. So it's it's a very scary place to be. Um, so I would just say like having information from the attorney, from this person who has this responsibility to be advocating for you, to be fighting for you, you know, you would feel just a bit more reassured if, you know, you were a part of the conversation somehow. And um, I think oftentimes we look at young people, you know, it doesn't even have to be a young child. We look at young teenagers and we just say, I don't know if they can handle this. And yet you're making decisions for them to be moving from school to school, from home to home, from family to family, you know, having to go to do X, Y, Z. And they weren't a part of that conversation and they don't know the, you know, potential consequences of actions, things like that. It's like, there's a, there's a lack of communication and a lack of transparency that if advocates, attorneys worked on that, piece just a just a bit more every day when you're working with young people um you'll you'll start seeing a lot of walls come down because there are a lot of walls that are going to be put up i remember i was a i was an educator and one thing i really lived by as a, as a teacher was my students did not care what i thought until they thought that i cared that's just like it's super important and it, that comes with like you can't show someone you care and withhold all of this really vital information from them and just expect them to be okay with it and just expect them to trust you and to and to listen to your you know your opinion and advice about something it's real it's a really hard thing to ask a young person or any any person yeah. to do yeah. yeah and um and you act we ask that a lot of um you know young people in the system while they're already going through other traumas you know that's a, that's an additional layer that you're you're putting on them of just not knowing what is going on uh, so I, I would say that's a pretty important top one i would say yeah the the phrase of you know nothing about me without me comes to mind <laughs> and get in wow. applicable to so many situations not just this right and and even as adults like how many of us want decisions made about us um or for us right or even conversations about us without us around so such an important piece. Yeah. Thanks, Nicole. When I answer questions like this, I come, I come, I have a mental health background. So whenever, whatever chance I get when talking to children's attorneys is to keep in mind um, or to have some kind of education around psychoeducation and really recognizing the impact that every decision, every interaction could have on the youth that they're working with. Uh, entering the foster care system is a traumatic experience in and of itself. And then to add to that, uh, the experiences that may have led them to coming in contact with the child welfare system, it's not, it's not the youth's fault. Um, and a lot of service providers, including uh, attorneys, may look at a youth and may look at what they see as behaviors when a lot of uh, what's going on in a youth's life 
a lot of what the responses that are being made are really just symptoms. Uh, what is going on around them? What has happened to them? And to really be cognizant of that, um, again, with every interaction, uh, with every decision that's being made. Um, an example of that is uh, attorneys and judges think that it's traumatizing or re-traumatizing for a youth to be part of the decision-making process so to attend court. But actually, if, they, if there was some psychological education there, they would understand that uh, when folks have experienced trauma, there is a need to to know what's going on. There is a need to have more information than maybe uh, other people. This shows up in, in different areas of life, but there there's actually a need for for wanting transparency to to know you know what's going on, um, and that's a lot less traumatizing than just making a decision and having a youth not have any say in it. And then uh, part of that too is decision making. Uh, I, I remind folks that the youth that they're working with, they're kind of they're setting them up to to go off into the world as uh, adults eventually, and taking away decision making power, taking away any little control that they have. Um, it's really setting them up to to make it hard to make decisions. Um, I joke with my friends, uh, you know, sometimes I make you know like jokes about like how uh, how difficult it was for me to make decisions once I went to to college over the smallest ones, and it was like, well, isn't somebody else going to decide this for me? And it was like, no, like, and so these are skills that folks are gaining. Um, that that you know, there's a lot of developmental stuff that is a lot of developmental opportunities that are missed for. For foster youth, I think when, you know, attorneys or any kind of service providers aren't taking into account uh, the impact that all of this is making on um, someone's identity, on someone's way of being, on someone's uh, just, you know, yeah, I think someone, you know, just who they are. So I think those are some of the things that I would have, you know, I know that that's not a big part of, of law school, I don't think. Um, I haven't never been to law school, but I don't think there is a lot of psychoeducation. And and I think that, it, you know, it's important to really to really understand that and uh, to approach the work in a trauma-informed lens, um, in a race equity lens. I don't think we could talk about this work without getting behind understanding like a youth background and and um, that that comes from getting input from a youth background and and getting to know who they are at their core and allowing them to have that piece of themselves and not take that away by making decisions without interacting in in a way that's going to be helpful uh, to the youth in the long run yeah you're you're hitting on something that I in my prior life and this is a long time ago 15 or so years ago, I ran our state agency of um, attorneys representing kids in court and talking to new attorneys and doing trainings and even uh, trainings in the community about the work. I actually used to always say there's actually no other legal career in which you have to know not just the law, but um, mental health, substance abuse, <laughs> DEI, race equity work. Uh, there's just it, the list trauma, right? Understanding trauma. There's The list goes on and on. Education, law, um, poverty, and there's so much um, writing on it, right? Not just for the, the children and youth that they're representing, but the families and the communities as well. And there's not, and it's not taught, right? Or at least it wasn't. I'm sure it is more now, but it, it's not always taught um, in law school. And then these attorneys pop out and get to go do it. And that training piece that I know NACC focuses on is just such a huge piece of this. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. And, and I think I'll add there too. Um, I'm also mindful of the fact that like, there is a lot of information that attorneys have to know and their specialty is in the law and there's other professions and other service providers that have that knowledge that also have, you know, that have um, a specialized in knowing uh, that side of the work. And so sometimes like, uh, attorneys aren't gonna, you know, know everything or, or get everything right all the time. But I think one of the the ways that I appreciate the field is moving towards is to really take a more multidisciplinary approach um, and know that like an attorney might not have, you know, the time, the resources, the, you know, whatever it is to be able to make all of these these decisions with so much of this in mind. But that's the importance of being able to um, to talk with with other folks. Uh, one example is like peer advocates that are that are uh, coming up in the field also and and talking with other lived experience experts and talking with social workers and and really uh, having that input um, and working in that regard because I, I am I am mindful of the fact that it is 
it is a lot. It is a lot of information. And so I, I just want to highlight the benefits, the importance of, of taking on a multidisciplinary approach and knowing that like attorneys may not always be able to, to function fully in like in, in that kind of, you know, in regard to psychoeducation and all of that stuff, but there is, a, is you know, uh, doing some due dil- diligence around what trauma-informed care looks like as an attorney is, is important. Yeah, it's they don't have to be experts in it, right? But knowing enough to know when it's coming up and how to interact and and when to refer and when to bring in professionals, I think is the key that you hit. And that's so important. Okay, well, one of our core values at PK is impact. And really, this whole podcast has been created around it because it's so essential to our work. And so for us, impact is about approaching every engagement with our energy focused on identifying the right goals, outcomes, and strategies, which aren't always the ones that were identified at the beginning, and um, that we each, every person that touches that word, right, has a personal responsibility to make a positive impact on our projects and our world. What I'm curious is for each of the three of you, what does impact mean to you, and what kind of an impact do you um, individually hope to have on this world? Um, I, when I think about impact, I really think about how it really just starts with one move and that one move movement, it really, um, you know, can change a life and then that life keeps changing other lives. And then those lives change the community and that community changes, you know, the, the state. And then it just, it really keeps going until it's like your impact on the world. So I, I know that's uh, that could feel like a lot of pressure, but I genuinely do think about that with every interaction I have. I think, how is this impacting the entire world? Because that's really how I think impact works. It's it's really this domino effect that what you do and what you say impacts that person you were speaking to and interacting with, and it influences how they're going to be for the rest of the day. And it's really like um, important that we sort of understand that and reflect on that because then all of a sudden we're going to watch and check ourselves a, a bit more to make sure that what we're putting out there in the world is positive. Well, well most of us, <laughs> um, you know, and, and what we're putting out there is positive because impact is not, it's not small, it's, it's tremendous. Uh, it just can sometimes start small or sometimes just seem small, but it really just keeps on, on rolling. So that's really how I look at impact. It's just that you're you're sort of putting this force out there, this this momentum out there, and it keeps on moving everything. So I, I look at impact as being this world changing thing. And again, I know that's a it's a lot of pressure, but um, I think that's why I try to do everything. Um, with intention, including resting. Like I'm working from home today because I know that if I keep on pushing myself, I, I'm i not going to be able to give as much energy to the work as I want to. So even even um, inaction has an impact, so. I love that. Really those small actions do add up and they move things. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> Crystal, do you wanna share with us kind of what impact means to you? and? What impact you hope to have on the world? Yeah, I think something that I reflected on uh, recently, or um, I was in a meeting yesterday too about like uh, I was talking with a service provider that was talking about well, like they keep calling me even years after I'm working with them, and usually they call uh, youth will call me when there's crisis or they need help, and was talking specifically about a youth that would call her pretty regularly, and she was like, well, I haven't, I haven't heard from the youth in a while and that's probably a good thing that probably means that things are are going well um and so some of that is you may not know the impact that you have on people the positive impact that you have and there's a lot of like good work that's uh that's being done that you might not ever like see come to fruition but just uh knowing that like you may have made a made an impact on somebody and and hope that that you did that in a positive way and kind of just uh, leading with that and doing what you can. As, I think similarly to Nicole, the the small things that eventually make a big impact or eventually can make a big impact. So just kind of like leading with with your values, leading with who you are. I've always said that like trying to change the world is is way too much pressure. 
we all have the the capacity and, and opportunity to change even just a small part of the world uh, that we're in, whether it's that as a small community um, in our backyard, uh, we can have impact on our family, which can shift, you know, the whole next generation. There's just like a lot of, of spaces um, and opportunity to have an impact. And I think if, you know, we all just do a little bit of the, you know, of what we're, what we're um, on this world to do and, and make that positive impact eventually that just, that just turns into a big impact overall. Um, and I think one of the things that I really want to have an impact on is just like a shift in how like success is deemed um, for, for foster youth, for, for, for youth who have experienced any kind of systems, for families who have experienced any systems. And really, um, it sounds simple if you don't know the work that, that it takes uh, to get there. But instead of seeing success as, you know, letters after people's names, degrees, um, instead of seeing it as like, not reentry and and reaching legal permanency, like uh, knowing that like families and and you have the opportunity to eventually have a calm nervous system. If we if we see success of that and and know and provide the education around to interact with folks to help with that and to also be able to educate folks on you know why they might feel the way that they do and and to normalize more things and to again give space to to healing and being able to move forward with life uh, once they've, not once they've, but hopefully they, they just don't enter the system, but being able to provide those opportunities and seeing success from that lens, I think would be an impact that I really want to see in the work that I do. And, and also just personally, I talk a lot about psychoeducation any chance I get and wanting people to to understand how life just affects people and, and what we can do as, you know, different communities to be able to help people achieve you know not achieve but just be able to to navigate the world with a with a calm nervous system yeah so i think what i'm hearing from you is you know keeping families together but also keeping those the it, the people in the families right calm happy like contributing like more even right and and less traumatized yes i love that allison what about you what kind of impact do you hope to have in addition to what Cristal and Nicole already mentioned, I think part of our impact at NACC is we hope to be our influence over the infrastructure at the state level and the local level for children's legal representation. And so when I think about the NACCLR and the work that we've done to integrate lived expertise across all of our programs, part of the impact we want to have is at systems level in replication of that, um, encouraging children's law offices around the country to do the same, to hire more staff with lived expertise um, th throughout their staffing models, to bring them in as peer advocates that help advise attorneys, to bring them in in other roles on staff and to leadership on their staff and help develop that pipeline of lived experience experts into the legal field. We're also doing work to try to support lived experience experts in law school and new graduates from law school to come into this field and stay into this field. So so we want to have that influence on children's law offices. We want to have that influence in legal services delivery systems writ large to really see lived expertise, just like Christelle said, like this is part of multidisciplinary work, just like we need you know great social workers and excellent clinicians and good lawyers and good judges, we also need dedicated and well-supported lived experience experts kind of infused throughout um, throughout the system. So we're trying to have that systems impact as well to, and to show like, hey, if NACC can do this, we can help you get there too um, by offering models for how to do it and also sharing our mistakes because um, this is an evolution and we haven't gotten it all right on the first try. <laughs> And so, you know, we try to be open about that and share our, our lessons learned and share how we're trying to do better. I love that. We have not gotten it exactly right either. I think that there's, I, but I do think that we learn so much from things that don't go well too. And it does change how we approach it in the future. And I also love how far you guys have gone focusing on what else people with lived expertise are bringing to the table, because I think that is a an evolution too, right? That needs to happen. And 
people need to be seen for more than just that experience. So I love how you guys are doing that at NACC. So let's talk a little bit more about the value that lived expertise is bringing. You guys started talking about it a little, but I want to dig in a little bit deeper. And so what do you think the value is, um, has been brought to systems and organizations through lived experts or lived experience? Yeah, I think um, what what uh, lived experience experts have brought is being able to see what people who haven't navigated the system uh, aren't able to see. Um, it's something I, I, I've shared often already, so I don't want to sound like a broken record, but when you navigate a system, uh, you see it from a completely different lens and there's just like a lot more that you can see when, you know, once you've navigated the system, uh, when making decisions, you you know how decisions are going to impact people because you felt the impact of of decisions um, that have been made prior. So I think that's one of the biggest uh, the biggest pieces. And I think I want to see a bigger shift, but there there's been a shift to really being able to see uh, the lived experience experts as the professionals that they are, and and not only um, having the lived experience, but being able to also understand from different areas of their professional backgrounds too, whether that's in the mental health background or education background or legal background or communications, but there's all these backgrounds that are able to contribute to what lived experiences, lived experience experts are contributing to the field. And I think that's really, that's really helpful because that, that in and of itself is like, a, it's a multidisciplinary person that you're able to, to really pull um, information from and, and being able to offer that to the field to to move it in a direction that it needs to be moved in. And I think it's beautiful and, and amazing that lived experience experts are willing to to offer that because it's not easy work. Um, but I think that they just that we're able to offer uh, a lot, a lot of uh, valuable uh, information. And, and it's just these, these seeds uh, that are planted, I think, with folks that are growing new trees instead of what the, the child welfare system has done before, with, which is just kind of like uh, trimming down stuff or, you know, like kind of putting a little bit more soil here and there. But I think lived experience experts are really um, able to offer new seeds that are that are we're going to see the change. Uh, and we are seeing the change of where the child welfare system is. Uh, the direction that it's going in. Nicole, what about you? What what value do you think lived expertise brings to systems and organizations? I think there's a honesty that sometimes can can get missed when you're dealing with just the politics of everything. You know, everyone likes to sort of look at politicians and and easily see how they're not doing something because they're worried about xyz happening but it happens to the best of us it happens to all of us in in many fields and and that includes in the social work in the legal fields you know you're you're trying to provide this really awesome advocacy support service for young people but you also have these barriers at um, these concerns and you don't want to, you know, step on the wrong toes and, and all of those little things for the professionals who do the work full time, it can, I don't think we realize it, but it can be very limiting in even the way we think about an approach and about um, a solution to the problem before us. Whereas I think live experts, you know, not in a disrespectful way, but in a different way, in a way that's, um, a bit free from those restrictions, they can sort of say, hey, this doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> like, you know, like, uh, actually, we might be better off, you know, sort of navigating over here in these waters. And and it's just, I think it's some, it's, it's like, I say it like this, even like with mandatory reporting, right? It's always well-meaning every single time. It's just not always well-founded. And I, I sort of think about that when it comes to those who are doing the work all of the time, always well-meaning. You get up every day. This is, this is what you, you've signed up for and you have a passion for, and everything is usually well-meaning. But it's not always on this foundation of what is going to work and what makes sense. And that's so important. The foundation has to be good or nothing else you build up is going to work. And I think live experts truly are able to get at the foundation component in ways that 
people who are doing this work for decades aren't able to because they're so used to the grind of let me navigate through this in a way where I have to consider, you know, not losing funding. I have to consider doing something wrong in the eyes of my supervisor. And like I said, not that the lived experts, um, you know, um, points are going to do those things, but it's it's avoiding the concern and the sort of mind block, I think the, the, the blocks on thoughts where it, it can really sort of stunt our thinking and lived experts are just a little more clear cut about why something doesn't work because they're just a, a bit freer as as consultants. I think they're a bit freer from the, you know, organizations. And and, and, and I think you take both then. And then I think you take what you know the limitations are, but also the raw honesty of what you just need to get done here. And you find this middle ground to get to solutions that are actually going to move things forward as opposed to just staying stagnant, which is what happens in a lot of cases. We see the problem, we recognize it, but we don't address it because we're worried about the politics. And I, I think we're experts, in addition to everything Kristan said, just add that sort of power. Well, I think we tend to see those limitations as barriers that can never be overcome, right? And I and I love the way you talked about the foundation, but I think that's also what you're saying is sometimes you have to break through those barriers and those limitations rather than just accepting them for something that is always going to be there. So yeah, ex exactly. Like I, I definitely have a mindset that every every single thing that I want to accomplish, I can accomplish. And it's like it's always funny to me how many people I run into, and they're like, "Oh, we can't do that," and I'm like, "I think we can." <laughs> yeah. Um, Allison, do you mind sharing kind of what value the the council and the lived expertise has brought to NACC as an organization? You know, one is that the integration of lived experts into a work has helped us slow down. And I mean that in the best of ways. Having lived experts at the table for important conversations, I think, has helped us prioritize authenticity and equity in those conversations over efficiency, which was a high value beforehand. You know, just, uh, everyone is always busy. Yeah, in a hurry. And having lived experts at the table has almost implicitly forced everyone to like take a breath and be like, okay, why are we really here? <laughs> and to push us all to, to move a little bit more slowly and intentionally. And I have seen subject matter experts really show up in a different way and focus conversations more on the heart of the issue when lived experts are in the room. So I think slowing us down in, in the best of ways is, is one important difference it's made to our process. Um, but it's the second thing is it's also made a big difference to our product. You know, there are certain policy choices we have made along the way that are different because of the lived expertise, value, and opinion that, that got us there. So a couple of examples is, is one, um, this fall, NECC released our revamped policy framework. And there are several policy topics that are debated in the field that, that were choice points when we were grappling with that in committee and with our board membership and with our national membership. And ultimately, you know, lawyers can always argue things 10 ways from Sunday and there's, you know, great reasons on side A and great reasons on side B. But ultimately, we we took stronger positions on several issues because of the strong um, opinions of our of our the NACCLR participants saying, no, we need to do um, this. One example of that uh, was in the NACC recommendations, which I mentioned earlier um, for decades we had remained as an organization agnostic on the model of legal representation that states used. We said, oh, you can use a best interest model or a hybrid model or a stated interest direct rep model. Um, and, and we had not taken a position on that. And NACC, of course, will continue to train and support in all states. But as a policy document that, you know, when we were looking at that again, we heard loud and clear from advisory council members that they want to be served by attorneys representing their expressed wishes, that they want judicial officers to hear from them directly, 
And so we endorsed that. And we took that stronger stance because of the strong feedback we heard from the advisory council. So it, having um, the NACCLR be part of our work has changed both the process, slowing it down and making it more intentional, and the product, um, the eventual choice points as well. I love it. Thanks for sharing that, Allison. I also love that you guys took that on as a policy position. So <laughs> one that I cared a lot about in my past life. Okay, so what I'm wondering, you know, doing this work can actually have a, a, a tremendous impact for the individual who is the lived expert. Sometimes it can be really challenging and really hard, <laughs> but there's um, often lots of value in it. And so I'm curious what value doing this work has brought to each of you individually. I think in total, like all the work that I've just done that has like led me to this, like even like going to grad school for counseling before like studying psychology and sociology and like being able to take that and bring it into this. Like I think, I think some people will like call the work healing. Um, I wouldn't say that it's healing, but it's brought like a lot of understanding of like systems, like how, how they work um, and being able to just like really understand that more. And I've been able to relate it to my own experience, to my family's experience, to uh, other people that I've known who have, who have had interactions with the system. And so there's that personal piece that it has brought to me individually. And professionally, I've had being able to to do this has helped me uh, really work with with a lot of different people, a lot of amazing people with a lot of different backgrounds and approaches to to this work. And so it's helped me really remain slash push me to continue to be more and more open minded about how um, how this work is done. I had um, a very I don't know if it's clear, but like a very specific idea of, of how to engage uh, lived experience experts and sometimes more slowly evolving and sometimes more like, OK, yeah, this has to be a shift here. And so I think it's really just uh, helped me specifically in the work with the with the NACCLR and NACC has helped me uh, as as a professional being able to um, really get grounded in in who and how I want to show up as um, a professional in regard to the child welfare system and and um, and broader than that uh, as I continue in my career. So those are some things of how this work has impacted me individually. Um, and I think sometimes the work the work is hard. I've I've had to uh, learn how to to be transparent and and um, there's a sense of vulnerability that comes to this work sometimes of of being in a meeting and everything's fine and somebody says something and you're like oh my gosh, like now I'm thinking about my brother or oh my goodness, I just like we're called something and there's, you know, a sense of that that just comes with the territory of um, some days are, are a little bit harder in ways that, that people will probably wouldn't imagine. It could be the smallest thing and it's like, oh, I think I'm going to carry this around for a little bit and I have to I have to do the work um, both personally and, and professionally uh, to show up as not always the best version of myself, but the the favorite, my favorite version of myself. And so there's just a lot of, of work to be uh, done around that, but it's rewarding. Um, it's difficult, but but it's it's rewarding and it's really um, taught me a lot. Thank you. Thank you for sharing because I, I think you're exactly right. It's very, very hard work. Um, not that there aren't benefits and value and, and times where it's very rewarding, but I do think it is hard. Nicole, what value has this work brought to you? Yeah, this work has been truly meaningful for me uh, on a personal level. I've felt just purpose in life and empowerment and, and just in ways that I never did before. Um, I, like I said, I, I did actually work at a at an agency in New York for about three years. And I remember I would try to give input then, uh, you know, I shared with some some folks that I I did you know, actually go through the system here. And I, I remember I would try to share that um, and, and, and just share thoughts and it wasn't always valued. And it was really difficult for me. And I, and I kept thinking subconsciously that maybe what I had to say wasn't, um, you know, important. Uh, like I said, for me, my faith is really important to me. So I even in the past year or so, I've really been able to just see like, wow, God had a purpose for me being in foster care and my brother and I being in care. We were in the system for about eight years. And, um, you know, that's a big chunk of one's childhood. And 
it was very difficult. It, it still it still has this impact, you know, on my family to this day. And I just couldn't for the life of me for so long figure out why that had happened. And um, even went to law school thinking, oh, I'm going to do family law. But then it felt so emotional to do it every single day. And yet, you know, all this time after graduating, I get to do the work in a meaningful way. But I get to do it in a way that doesn't, you know, traumatize me every single day because organizations like NACC are, are working towards how to, you know, really value our experience and our and our professional expertise. And um, all of that really helps for it to be a process that's, um, you know, I used the word before, empowering, because I, I lived many years of life not knowing I could help even though I really wanted to and um even just yeah the, the purpose piece that that really it, it's one of the biggest examples and, and will be you know all my life that uh you know things just we don't just go through the difficult experiences we go through for the sake of going through it there is an experience and lessons and just this ability to extend grace and, and love and care towards someone else who also is going through it or or is going through, you know, similar difficulties. Like I I have felt more in this past year the ability to just help someone and and just be patient with others um, than I ever have before because I see how much it's just needed for um again, not just young people, but all people, you know, need a need a bit of grace and and love and care and um this work and and the ability to be a part of it has been um super important in my life because i um we, we were talking about it before the little shell that i like to stay in yeah. you know i i don't always stay in it now because i feel like oh if i come out here if i'm a part of this conversation here if i if I do this podcast with Cristal and Allison, you know, um, <laughs> you know, maybe just maybe it'll it'll have the the impact we were all talking about um, a little while ago, and um, it's crazy to think because I used to not think that I could be a part of such an impact, but I do think that now, and I, I do think we have the ability to help all who have gone through the system feel that if we would just really value getting feedback from them and working to improve. Uh, the way that we we care for children in this country. Yeah, you're hitting on um, just that finding purpose in hardship, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. how important that is for for all of us, right? Because if if there's nothing else about life, it's not similar. It's we all have challenge and hardship and pain, and finding that purpose through it is such an important piece of of the work, right? That Crystal, you were talking about, such an important piece. Okay, well. Last question to wrap us up here is if we have the listeners who are interested in adding lived expertise or lived experts to their programs or their projects or their organization, I'm curious if you guys have any tips or tricks or lessons learned or advice that you would share with the listeners today. Yeah, uh, it's something that, um, that I can share too is uh, NACC has um, a few tip sheets available. Um, three different tip sheets on engaging youth or uh, lived experience experts. There's uh, a case level uh, tip sheet on engaging uh, youth in uh, the court process and in general at, at the case level. Uh, there's a systems level for attorneys or law offices that are wanting to engage lived experience experts um, in, in law offices or folks that may be interested in engaging lived experience experts more on um, any kind of uh, systems level. Um, and there's also a readiness assessment uh, slash tip sheet for uh, attorneys and law offices that are wanting to engage and uh, maybe incorporate peer advocates into uh, their legal representation representation model. Uh, you can find all of this on NACC's website and feel free to check them out and, and uh, reach out to me via email uh, if there's any, uh, if folks have any questions or would like technical assistance in regard to any of uh, any of those topics. Thank you so much. Allison, any um, tips or tricks or lessons learned that you would share? I think I would just encourage folks to 
um, reach out to NACC and the NACCLR as a resource. Cristal is available, our NACCLR is available, and um, you know, we've done a lot of interesting partnerships in that, in, over the last three years, not just to infuse lived expertise in NACC's work, but to partner with other organizations and the state, local, and national level for live trainings, virtual trainings, um, policy work, technical assistance opportunities. So I would just encourage folks to reach out um, to us, uh, reach out to Crystal specifically, if you have ideas in mind. Nicole, anything that you would add? The only thing in addition to what Allison and Crystal have already said, uh, just have some, you know, have some patience and um, when, when, when doing this work and don't just extend grace to others, but also to yourself. Because, you know, this is, uh, it's not easy. And, um, you know, if you haven't been working with lived experts before or in, in the ways that we've been sort of talking about here, if you haven't been, you know, solution-oriented in a, in a way that, you know, you, know you, you feel proud of, you know, that doesn't have to continue being the, the case because uh, we're all just tackling this work. And, you know, it's, it's really great that you're a part of it. Just know that there's impact in even what you do too, you know, but yes, when you're working with lived experts, it'll be just this really wonderful experience, um, but not just for us, but for everyone involved, because what is brought to the table, it's not just the innovation that we can bring, but it's the experience that you can bring. And each part of it is so important. So I, I think just get up each day and, and know that what you're doing is important and yeah just reach out to us if there's anything we can do to help thank you guys um i feel like i could stay and talk to you for probably the rest of the day this has been a wonderful conversation and so much great information um so i can't thank um all of you enough for being here today to to connect to learn to grow to breathe and to share until next time this is stacy signing off <laughs>